Church. I praise God for that wonderful piece of music. I thank God today for this privilege um, of sharing his word with you. And I would also like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the Women's Ministry Department who gave me this opportunity to preach on this occasion of International Women's Day of Prayer. I'm only the spokesperson today, however, I'm assured that God has a message for each one of us and especially for the women of this church. Before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this blessed Sabbath day. As we worship you in spirit and in truth, may we understand the importance of today's message. Help us so that we can experience the power of prayer in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Christ's sacrifice on behalf of man was full and complete. The condition for atonement had been fulfilled. The work for which he had come to this earth had been fully accomplished. Before ascending to heaven, Christ gave his disciples uh, their commission. He told them that they were to be the executors of his will. They were to carry the work forward in Christ's name. Christ did not tell his disciples that this work is going to be easy. In fact, he showed them the vast confederacy of evil which arrayed against them. The disciples would have to fight against principalities, against power, against spiritual forces and wickedness in high places. But they were not left to be alone to fight this fight. Christ's visible presence was soon uh, to be withdrawn from the earth. But a new endowment of power was to be of the disciples. The Holy Spirit was to be given to them in its full manifestation, sealing them for the work they had to do. Behold, the Savior said to them, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but ye tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Luke chapter 24, verses 49. In obedience to Christ's command, the disciples, they waited in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They did not wait in idleness. In fact, they spent time praying earnestly to God. The record says that they were praying in the temple, praising and blessing God's name. They were bringing their requests to the Father in the name of Jesus. They knew that now they have a representative in heaven, an advocate at the throne of God, which is Jesus. In solemn awe, they prayed, repeating the assurance, um, which says, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my Father's name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. John chapter 16, verses 23 and 24. Now as the disciples waited in fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words of Savior, which had, spoken to, which had been spoken to them before his death, they truly understood its meaning. Truths which had passed away from their memory now returned to their minds, and these they repeated to each other, comforting each other. The disciples prayed with earnestness for a fitness to meet men and in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. Putting away all their differences, all their desire for supremacy, they came close in Christian fellowship. They drew nearer and nearer to God and as they did this, they realized what a privilege had been theirs to be associated with the Son of God. Now these days of preparation 
were very deep, heart-searching. The disciples felt the need, um, need and cried to the Lord with holy unction to fit them for the work that they had to do for the saving of the souls. They did not merely pray for blessings for themselves, but they were burdened with the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the ends of the earth. And they claimed the power that Christ had promised to them. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. As a result of their prayer, and as a result of Jesus' promise, the Spirit came upon the waiting, praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart. The Infinite One revealed himself with power to his church, and we know the work was miraculous after that. What a perfect example of transformation by prayer. Transformed by prayer is the title of today's sermon. I don't know if the slide show. Um, yeah, we can move to the next slide. According to Sister Ellen G. White, she writes that prayer is the opening of heart to God as to a friend, not that it is necessary for us to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring us down, uh, bring God down to us but it brings us up to him. She also writes, why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence? Today in the sermon church, we are going to learn five valuable lessons applicable to our Christian journey. Let's move on to our lesson number one. If you go to the next slide, the first lesson teaches us that we need to pray bold prayers. The disciples prayed bold prayers, not based on how they were, but based on Christ's grace, his merits, and the assurance of his promises. They truly experienced transformation which prepared them for their ministry. When we pray church, we should put all our heart and mind to it. When we seek God in prayer, we are to go boldly to his throne. But the problem is, church, that we do not know God enough to go boldly to his throne, to trust him like the disciples did, and to go confidently in his presence. Because to know God is to spend time with him. And to spend time with him is to prioritize him in your day-to-day -day life by reading his word and by praying. Prayer is not a monologue. In fact, it is a dialogue. In prayer, we not only talk to God, but God also speaks with us. Now you will ask me, church, how do we know that God speaks to us? And I can answer this question very confidently by telling that when we read the word of God, we listen to him daily. And that's how God speaks to us. When we pray, we talk to him. But by reading the word of God, God talks to us. Praying and reading the Bible, reading the Bible and praying, they both go hand in hand. And that is why prayer is a dialogue with God. Bold prayers do not focus on self. It's not about us all the time. Bold prayers focus on God. I'm going to quickly um, narrate the event from Acts chapter 4. Uh, Peter and John, when they were arrested, threatened, beaten, persecuted, not to speak about Jesus anymore. What kind of prayer they did? Imagine, church, if we are beaten and persecuted, what kind of prayer we would be praying? Maybe for justice, maybe freedom or even God's protection to save us. But let's see what Peter and John did. Peter and John, they prayed bold prayers. Even after being threatened, 
not to preach Christ, they prayed in one accord for boldness that they may speak his word. And once again, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you a question now? How many of us preach when we are persecuted? Or let me ask the other way around. How many of us preach even though we are not persecuted? Now listen carefully. Those who are truly converted, they cannot keep it inside. When you pray, you receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power. And when you receive power, you witness for Christ. You cannot help but tell everyone what a God you have. And that is Transformation Church. Now let me share a personal testimony with you. I work as a mental health nurse in the acute hospital. My job is to listen to people's problems daily. Many come with a desire to end their life. And while they are on the edge of going to the other side, they seek for the mental health team to support them. Because probably that is their last resort. One such day, I met an elderly patient um, who had written a suicide note for one of the nurses in the assessment suite, stating that he intends to end his life if his pain is not managed. I was called to assess this patient, and upon my assessment, he kind of denied that he had any sort of these negative thoughts to end his life at that moment. I was convinced, assessing him, that he would not go and harm himself in any way. Hence, I supported and directed him uh, to the particular team and the community where his pain could be managed. Uh, even the medics on the assessment suite felt that he was okay to get discharged and following my assessment, they discharged this patient home. Now, long story short, I contacted his wife in the evening to kind of relay the plan that I had discussed with this patient. And to my surprise, this, his wife told me that um, he had not reached home that evening. Apparently, he had been discharged with a bag of pain relief medication. And you know when the patients have so much medication with them, all sort of thoughts race through your mind as to what has he done to himself. Hence, all sort of thoughts race through my mind as well. And I tried to recall every word of his assessment, assuring me that he was not going to take his life. At that point, I could only pray. I prayed for his safety and return home. I prayed while I was at work. I prayed when I was on the bus home. I prayed when I reached home. I kept praying for this patient. Praying in my sleep when I was in my bed. I never stopped. The most important aspect of this testimony is that that morning when I assessed him, that morning when I was going to work, I rushed through my morning prayer and devotion. And when I say I rushed, I actually rushed through. I didn't have much time to speak or listen to God that day. However, God was faithful in talking to me like he always does. And as I brushed through the Bible, he directed me to a passage of scripture uh, which I would like to show you. I don't know what the... I think it's the slide before that. Yeah, that was the scripture that I received from God. Blessed are those who have regard uh, for the weak. The Lord delivers them in the time of trouble. That day in prayer, I had surrendered my will, my job, my family, my life in his hands. I was confident that God um, will deliver me when the trouble comes. That day I also awaited trouble. I was kind of suspecting something. And I knew exactly um, when this particular patient went missing, what was God trying to tell me in the morning. God's promise of deliverance from this trouble was the only assurance I was clinging on. That was the only promise that I had to cling on and pray for this patient that day. Also realizing that even the job that he gave me was for my spiritual growth. This missing patient could have ended up as a risk to himself 
and that could have then endangered my job as well. But I was confident that God's promise never fails, even though my assessment could have. When I went back to work after two days, I learned that the patient had still not been found. We rang the police, we tried to get the update, but there was nothing in that morning. And um, later on in the afternoon, the police rang to my office and stated that the night before, the patient had been safely sent home and he was safe and sound after two days of sleeping rough in the town. Amen. My heart rejoiced and I was overjoyed that God has done it again. And he has done it because he's been faithful in keeping his promises. I couldn't keep this joy to myself and I kind of shared this with my colleagues who were surprised to know what a God we have who also tells us things are way ahead of time. So that was the testimony that really shocked me and told me that I need to spend time in prayer. Lesson number two. Don't pray in crisis, pray every day. Church, we need an armor of God's protection. If we realize how tough our week had been, I know each of us, when we go to work and come every Sabbath to church, just have a little reflection of your week. If we realize how tough it has been, if we could discern how much Satan attacked us through our week, we would also then realize how much God worked on protecting us because it could have been worse without his protection. When Satan comes to attack us, we should quote to him Bible verses and he runs away. And we are very well um, aware that the devil trembles with the sound of fervent prayers. How did Jesus know in the wilderness what to say to the devil when he attacked him? That's because Jesus spent time in solitude in the mornings in prayer. If Jesus, the Son of God, felt the need of talking to his heavenly Father, how much we should feel the urge of prayer knowing that we are so weak and fragile. When Satan attacks us with discouragement, with failures, with accusations, with disappointments and feelings of rejection, are we ready to quote back scriptures to him? Because when you quote it, he will flee. If you don't put scriptures in memory, if you don't spend time in prayer, there's nothing to call out in the time of trouble. There's nothing to lean on when you have trouble at your door. If you go to the slide, you can see Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in, in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. I really like the ending of this uh, verse, as he did aforetime. Was this something new for Daniel? He did this daily. So what we understand from here is, don't pray in crisis, pray every day. Moving on to our lesson number three. Pray for what to pray before you pray. Pray for what to pray before you pray. Most of the time we think that prayer is a shopping list. We think that we want blessings from God all the time, but we don't want the God of the blessings. As soon as we get what we want, we harden our hearts. Most of our prayers are selfish prayers. We are seldom um, very ungrateful. We are seldom grateful for what we have and uh, present our supplication with constant dissatisfaction in our prayers. Were the Israelites not the same? They were no different to us, church. In the wilderness, they didn't appreciate manna. What they wanted was McDonald's, isn't it? They didn't appreciate water. They wanted Coke. The Israelites didn't appreciate the blessings. They didn't appreciate the bread of heaven. They wanted a beautiful cake. We are no different to them, brothers and sisters. That is why a question arises in my heart. Who is teaching us to pray so that we don't pray miserably? Let us go to Romans chapter 8, verse 26. 
Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's really beautiful. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness to pray. With our prayers, we mostly try to manipulate God to answer according to our will, not realizing that we need to wait for his will to happen in our life because in the middle of that, there is a little bit called transformation that needs to happen. God is working on us as long as we pray and go to him. And that is the process of transformation. Moving on to our lesson number four. When you pray, believe that God will answer. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to deserve it. Hannah, you remember Hannah from the Bible? She had drawn near to the entrance of the tabernacle. And in the anguish of her spirit, she prayed and wept sore. Yet she communed with God in silence, uttering no sound. In those evil times, such scenes of worship were rarely witnessed. Irreverent feasting and even drunkenness were not uncommon, even at these religious festivals. And hence, Eli, the high priest, observing Hannah, supposed that she has overcome with wine, thinking to administer a deserved rebuke. He sternly said, how long will you be drunken? Put away your wine. Pained and startled, Hannah answered gently, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. The high priest was deeply moved, for he was a man of God. And I really like this part of the story. In place of a rebuke, he uttered a blessing. He uttered a blessing to Hannah. He said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Hannah's prayer was granted. She received the gift that she earnestly entreated. And as she looked upon the child, she called him Samuel, asked of God. We know that Samuel was sent away from home at an early age and how he ministered um, in the temple of God. And we know the story. Do you think that Hannah still, even after being separated from her child, stopped praying for her child? That's the most interesting part of the story. Every day, Samuel was subject to Hannah's prayers. Every year she made with her own hands a little robe of service for him. And as she went up with her husband to worship at Shiloh, she gave the child this reminder of her love. Every fiber of the little garment had been woven with a prayer that he might be pure, noble, and true. Let us see Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It tells us, it reads like this, therefore I say to you, whatever things you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. What an amazing promise is this. Hannah believed. Her countenance was lifted as soon as she poured out her heart to God before even receiving the answer to her prayer. Sometimes we feel, church, that in order to receive an answer, we need to deserve it. But God doesn't look at it that way. He doesn't. We don't have to understand. We don't have to deserve it. Hannah did not understand. Neither did she um, know how the blessing was going to come and when and how it was going to be given to her. The assurance from the priest was the only thing that she had. And the only um, assurance she had that God would bless her and remember her in due time. Church, we can claim our blessings by just believing, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted like we, yet without sin. 
Jesus is our high priest. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Lesson number five. This is my favorite lesson because I've learned it myself. Answers to prayer are part of the transformation process. Answers to prayer are part of the transformation process. We're going to quickly see the narrative of Acts chapter 12. Here we find a story of two of Jesus' disciples, James and Peter. First, King Herod killed James, the brother of John. That kind of pleased the Jews so well that Herod seized Peter and placed him in the prison. The story tells us church uh, that uh, the church had a prayer meeting in the home of Mary, mother of Mark, to pray for Peter's release. God heard and answered their prayer. In fact, he even sent an angel to release Peter from the prison and guide him safely to the home where the church was praying for him. The reaction of the believers when Rhoda, the servant girl, went to the gate to receive Peter. That reaction was really interesting and unbelievable. The Bible says that Rhoda knew it was Peter's voice. But when she told them, who is them, the church, they doubted it. Weren't they praying for this exact same outcome? Yet they doubted it, uh, that it was Peter at the gate. Now listen carefully, church. In the process of transformation, answers to our prayers have a significant role to play. As humans, we pray. And when we pray, we already work out a logical answer in our mind, with our finite minds. We forget that God, in his infinite wisdom, sees the bigger picture. Similar to this, I would like to share a small testimony with you today. In the year 2018, my family and I had seen one miracle after another as God had unfolded his plan for us to come to the UK. With the experiences and leading that we uh, received from God, it was almost felt as though we were entering the land of Canaan. In the sequence of many miracles and testimonies, I would like to share with you just one small testimony. For people who don't know that I come from India, and it was in May 2018, I had come towards the process of my um, UK visa, uh, not visa, the U full UK process, and the last thing on the list was the visa uh, to come here as a registered nurse. I knew I can apply for the visa, uh, and once I apply for it, my time was short um, as, you know, once the visa comes, I will have to leave my family back in India and fly to UK for employment. Uh, Joseph, my husband, had lost his mother in the same month of May in 2018, and we were going through a big emotional turmoil. I prayed for strength and fasted every Friday, asking God to provide me uh, with the courage and strength that I needed uh, to separate from my family. Because it was the very first time I was going to leave my parents, I, I didn't even leave them after marriage. That was the first time I was going to leave them, my husband, my child, behind in, U, uh, behind in India to travel to UK. And the usual norm for an overseas nurse is that they travel first to the UK, pass their exams, get their registration, and after a period of six to eight months, the plan was to bring my family to the UK. My logical answer to the prayer was that I needed courage and strength to separate from my family. However, God saw the bigger picture, and he likes to surprise his children. The Friday that I was fasting, I received a telephone call from the recruitment uh, in UK asking me if I was able to travel with my family to UK. I was shocked beyond senses. 
just like the church in Acts chapter 12. I didn't believe this was the miracle that God had worked for us. I didn't even believe at that time that it was an answer to my prayer. I immediately phoned my pastor and told him that I was asked to travel with my family to UK. And not only that, but the employer is willing to give us a maintenance for six months. And in perplexity, I questioned my pastor whether it was really God who worked out this miracle for us. As I was trying to figure out logic, doubting God's plan, I remember the words of my pastor echoing the phone. He said, when God does it, the result is unbelievable, illogical, and far exalting human mind. We then decided that this was a miracle. We accepted and we put our faith in God and we decided to come here as a family. We traveled to the UK and at that time I realized that I was asking for too small a blessing because our God is a God who works mighty things. Amen. That prayer taught me. You know what it taught me? It's something called as crazy faith. Faith without logic, faith that wins victories. Amen. When Peter was released from prison, this miraculous experience was not for him alone, but it was also to be used for strengthening of the church. One of the most remarkable thing about prayer is that it restores our mind. You ask me, I'm a mental health nurse, what restores mind? Nothing like prayer, nothing like word of God. Only God can change the way we think about our life, about others, about ourselves, and about the future. He brings transformation into our lives when we pray. He begins this work of transformation, and the first thing he begins it is in the mind. And I really loved it, because I love mind, because I'm a mental health nurse. So I was amazed to know the transformation begins in your mind, the part of your brain which makes decisions, judgments, and choices. Towards the end of this sermon, I would like to address the woman in a very special way today. My sisters in Christ, we are co-laborers with God. Sister Ellen G. White writes that wonderful is the mission of the wives and mothers and the younger women workers. If they will, or if we will, they can exert an influence for good to all around them. There are women who should labor in the gospel ministry. The way is open for consecrated women. Especially does responsibility lies upon the mother. She writes that by whose lifeblood the child is nourished and its physical frame built up, imparts to its child mental and spiritual influences to tend and shape the mind and character. It was Jochebed, the Hebrew mother, who in strong faith was not afraid of the king's commandment, of whom was born Moses, the deliverer of Israel. It was Hannah, the woman of prayer and self-sacrifice and heavenly inspiration, who gave birth to Samuel, the heaven-instructed child, the incorruptible judge, the founder of Israel's sacred schools. It was Elizabeth, the kinswoman and kindred spirit of Mary of Nazareth, who was the mother of Savior's herald. Prayer means very much to God's children, and thank offerings should come up before God evening and morning. If you are a mother, however pressing your business, do not fail to gather your family around God's altar. Ask for the guardianship of your holy angels in your home. Remember that your dear ones are exposed to temptations every day. If you are a wife, and while you ensure you provide for the household, just like the virtuous, industrious woman from Proverbs 30, 31, understand that it is your solemn duty to pray that your lamp does not go out. As you need the power of the Holy Spirit continually to build and make your family. If you are a young woman seeking for answers and you don't have any, spend time in prayer so that you are in continual communion 
with your heavenly father, with his divine instructions, leading you in the right path. If you are a woman called for medical missionary work in hospitals and homes, and while meeting those medical needs, you will also have the door opened to meet the spiritual needs. Pray that you reach out for souls who are dying and perishing without Christ. Was it not Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the mother of James, and other women with them who first preached the risen Christ to the disciples? In ancient times, the Lord worked in wonderful ways through consecrated women, who united in his work with men whom he had chosen to stand as his representatives. He used women to gain great and decisive victories. More than once in times of emergency, he brought them to the front and worked through them the salvation of many souls. Through Esther, the queen, the Lord accomplished a mighty deliverance for his people. At a time when it seemed that no power could save them, Esther and the woman associated with her by prayer and by fasting and by prompt action met the issue and brought salvation to their people. This is very important as we come to the last part of our sermon. We need to understand that transformation is not a one-day phenomena. Prayer takes us through that process as we seek and behold the face of our Savior in daily communion with him. The more we look at him, the more we become like him. Let us see Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It reads, if you be I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but, by the trans but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which I have highlighted as prayer, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Today, I would like to urge the church to have an intimate relationship with Christ. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit desires an intimate relationship with us. Over and over in the Bible, we have seen examples of people today who have had that intimate relationship with him. And he is willing to establish the same relationship with us. Let us be transformed by accepting his invitation today. Thank you.